very much for coming. Thank you very much to everybody in the room here. Thanks to everybody who's in the overflow um, room over in the Rose Bowl. That's how popular the event's been. And uh, we're streaming this event online as well. So um, it's been a tremendous uh, response to the day that we've got uh, set out for you today. Um, there is a slight irony to me introducing a wellbeing day to you, given the way I feel at the moment. Um, my attendance here is sponsored by Beecham, so that's all I'm going to say. So. <laughs> Um, so, yes, th thank you. Uh, I say a warm welcome. Um, we've got an exciting afternoon of guest lectures for you, um, organised by our student wellbeing team here at Leeds Beckett. Um, the team uh, works to provide emotional, psycho psychological support to students while studying at our university. Any student can access the service and access a range of support during their studies from qualified mental health professionals and counsellors. University Mental Health and Wellbeing Day is an annual event initiated by the University Mental Health Advisors Network. This network is an organisation set up for professionals in specialist, practically focused mental health roles working within higher education. The network is dedicated to and has a practical role in providing support to students experiencing mental health difficulties. It aims to promote the mental health and well-being of people who live and work in higher education. Including the aims of the network are to encourage and develop the, the culture in which people with mental health difficulties studying in HE level can become a mainstream notion become an advocate to and liaise with relevant bodies to promote the rights and interests of students with mental health difficulties and to try to ensure that proportionate weighting is given to these issues in policy terms. Here at Leeds Beckett uh, University, uh, to reflect our ongoing commitment to promote the positive mental health of our staff, our students and our partners, we're proud to mark University Mental Health Day with today's guest lecture series. Today's about spreading the message that mental health, like physical health, is important is about breaking down the misconceptions, the prejudices and the stigma which surround mental health issues and encouraging people to start a conversation. That conversation can make all the difference to someone who might be struggling. Alongside today's guest lectures are a number of internal and external services are showcasing their support for the day with an exhibition in our students' union space which is just down the hall just down there. We're going to have a break at, at three o'clock after our first two speakers where there'll be some refreshments and opportunity to, to, to um, talk to the people who will be exhibiting down there so I'd encourage you all to, to join us. Uh, you can talk to organisations including Rethink Mental Illness, Student Minds and Community Links, all of whom are working to support, empower and promote positive mental health as well as our own students, unions, officers and volunteers. In October 2014, to mark World Mental Health Day, we at Leeds Un Beckett University organised a week of activities aimed at promoting positive mental well-being and tackling stigma and discrimination. The week culminated with our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Susan Price, signing a pledge of support on behalf of Leeds Beckett University to end negative attitudes towards people with mental health problems. The pledge, which is part of MIND's Time to Change national campaign, signifies a reward, renewed commitment by our university to eliminate the stigma and discrimination experienced by people with mental health difficulties. You, when we have the break at three o'clock, you'll have your own opportunity to sign our mental health pledge on the pledge wall, which is down in the exhibition area. Find out more about the support available for students here at Leeds Beckett, and even take advantage of a free massage courtesy of InTouch, a Leeds holistic therapy service. That might be quite fun if you all try and do that. <laughs> but first to our series of uh, speakers this afternoon, and, and, and up first is Dr. Eleanor Longdon. Um, Dr. Eleanor, Dr. Longdon is a research associate at the University of Liverpool's Psychosis Research Group with a specialist interest in voice hearing, trauma and disassociation. She has a BSc and an MSc in psychology. Her book, Learning from the Vo Voices in My Head, challenges society's definition of crazy. In the book, Eleanor calls for new, nuanced understanding of voice hearing and urges us to see madness not as in condition, but as a process, one through which those who struggle with mental health issues have the chance to emerge with their sanity intact. So it's a great pleasure that I introduce Eleanor to open up our session this afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs> you might not need that, I do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So, I'm here today to talk about a singular and striking human experience, which is hearing voices that no one else can hear. Now, this is an absorbing topic. Um, it captures the nuance of perception. It captures the nature of self. And it's been discussed and documented for over 2,000 years of human history. 
It's been feared, reviled, celebrated, consecrated and forensically scrutinised in such diverse specialities as psychology, philosophy, theology and cultural studies. But it holds a very special fascination for me because for nearly half my life I've heard voices myself. Now, over the years, these voices have changed, multiplied, terrorised, inspired and encouraged. Today, they're a very intrinsic and valued part of my identity. But there was also a time when their presence drove me to delirious extremes of misery, desperation and despair. And the evolution of that understanding and the remarkable privileges and terrible penalties that it entailed form the first part of this talk. However, the second emphasis shifts from the personal to the political, from the individual to the collective, and briefly outlines how wisdom gained from the International Hearing Voices Movement can be used to support more people to listen to their voices without anguish, and to reiterate that the right to create a peaceful, rewarding future, irrespective of one's painful present or harrowing past, is a fundamental right of everyone who hears voices. Now, this story about a voice and a voice hearer begins with me leaving home for the very first time to go to university. And this was a bright day. It was brimming with hope and optimism. I'd done well at school, expectations for me were high, and I gleefully entered the student life of lectures and parties and traffic home theft. Now, appearances, you all know it's true. Now, appearances, of course, can be very, very deceptive, and to an extent, this feisty, energetic persona of lecture-going and traffic cone stealing was a veneer, albeit a very well-crafted and convincing one. Underneath, I was actually deeply unhappy, insecure, and fundamentally frightened. Frightened for the people, of the future, of failure, and of the emptiness that I felt was within me. But I was skilled at hiding it, and from the outside appeared to be someone with everything to hope for and aspire to. And this fantasy of invulnerability was so complete that I even deceived myself. And as the first semester ended and the second begun, there was no way that anyone could have predicted what was just about to happen. Now, it was during my second term that it started. I was leaving a seminar, humming to myself, fumbling with my bag, just as I'd done a hundred times before, when suddenly I heard a voice calmly observe, she is leaving the building. I looked around and there was no one there, but the clarity and decisiveness of the comment was unmistakable. Shaken, I left my books on the stairs and hurried home, and there it was again. She is opening the door. This was the beginning. The voice had arrived and the voice persisted days and then weeks of it on and on narrating everything i did in the third person she is going to a lecture she is going to the library it was neutral impassive and even after a while strangely companionate and reassuring although i did notice that its calm exterior sometimes slipped and that it would occasionally mirror my own unexpressed emotion so for example if i was angry and had to hide it which i often did being very adept at concealing how I really felt, then the voice would sound frustrated. Otherwise, it was neither sinister nor disturbing, although even at that point, it was apparent that the voice had something to communicate to me about my emotions, particularly emotions which were remote and inaccessible. Now, it was then that I made a fatal mistake in that I told a friend about the voice and she was horrified. A subtle conditioning process had begun. The implication that normal people don't hear voices and the fact that I did implied that something was very seriously wrong. Such fear and mistrust was infectious. Suddenly, the voice didn't seem quite so benign anymore. And when she insisted I seek medical help, I duly complied and which proved to be mistake number two. Now, I spent him some time telling the college GP about what I perceived to be the real problem. Anxiety, low self-worth, fears about the future, and was met with bored indifference, until I mentioned the voice. Upon which he dropped his pen, swung round, and began to question me with a show of real interest. And to be fair, I was desperate for interest and help, and I began to tell him about my strange commentator. And I really wish at this point the voice had said she is digging her own grave, because I was referred to a psychiatrist who <coughs> likewise took a grim view of the voice's presence, subsequently interpreting everything I said through a lens of latent insanity. For example, I was part of a student TV station that broadcast news bulletins around the campus and during an appointment, which was running very late, 
So I'm sorry, doctor, I've got to go. I'm reading the news at six. Now, I ended up in my medical records. Elna has delusions that she is a television news broadcaster. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, it was at this point that events began to rapidly overtake me. A hospital admission followed, the first of many. Diagnosis of schizophrenia came next. And then, worst of all, a toxic, tormenting sense of hopelessness, humiliation and despair about myself and my prospects. But having been encouraged to see the voice not as an experience, but as a symptom, my fear and resistance towards it intensified. Now, essentially, this represented taking an aggressive stance towards my own mind, a kind of psychic civil war. And in turn, this caused the number of voices to increase and grow progressively hostile and menacing. Helplessly and hopelessly, I began to retreat into this nightmarish inner world in which the voices were destined to become not only my persecutors, but also my only perceived companions. They told me, for example, that if I could prove myself worthy of their help, then they would change my life back to how it had been. And a series of increasingly bizarre tasks were set, a kind of labour of Hercules. These started off quite small, so for example, pull out three strands of hair, but gradually it grew more extreme, culminating in commands to harm myself and a particularly dramatic instruction. You see that lecturer over there, you see the glass of water on his desk, or you have to pour it over him in front of the other students, which I actually did, which I'm secretly quite proud of, um, but which needless to say did not endear me to, well, anyone. Um, <laughs> and in effect, a very sort of vicious cycle had now been established, a fear of avoidance, of mistrust, um, a cycle that that I felt powerless to break and incapable of establishing peace or reconciliation. Two years later, and the deterioration was dramatic. By now, I had the whole frenzied repertoire, terrifying voices, grotesque visions, bizarre, intractable delusions. My mental health status had been a catalyst for discrimination, for verbal abuse, and for physical and sexual assault. And I've been told by my psychiatrist, Eleanor, you'd be better off with cancer because cancer is easier to cure than schizophrenia. I'd been diagnosed, drugged and discarded and was by now so tormented by the voices that I attempted to drill a hole in my head in order to get them out. Now, looking back on the wreckage and despair of those years, it seems to me now as if someone died in that place and yet someone else was saved. A broken, haunted person began the journey, but the person who emerged was a survivor and would ultimately grow into the person I was destined to be. Many people have harmed me in my life, and I remember them all, but the memories grow pale and faint in comparison with the people who've helped me. The fellow survivors, the fellow voice hearers, the comrades and collaborators, the mother who never gave up on me, who believed that one day I would come back to her and was willing to wait for me for as long as it took. The doctor, who only worked with me for a brief period, but who reiterated his belief that recovery was not only possible, but inevitable, and during a period of devastating relapse, told my terrified family, please don't give up hope. I believe that Eleanor can get through this. Sometimes you know it snows as late as May, but summer always comes eventually. This talk is not enough time to fully credit those good and generous people who fought with me and for me and who waited to welcome me back from that agonised, lonely place. But together, they forged a blend of courage, creativity, integrity and an unshakable belief that my shattered self could become healed and whole. I used to say that these people saved me, but what I now know is that they did something even more important in that they empowered me to save myself. And crucially, they helped me to understand something that I'd always suspected, that the voices I was hearing were a meaningful response to traumatic life events, particularly childhood events, and as such were not my enemies, but a source of insight into solvable emotional problems. Now, at first, this seemed very difficult to believe, not least because the voices by this time were so menacing and aggressive. And in this respect, a crucial first step was learning to separate out a metaphorical meaning for what I'd previously interpreted as a literal truth. So, for example, voices which threatened to attack my home, I learned to interpret as my own sense of fear and insecurity in the world rather than an actual objective danger. Now, at first, I would have believed them. I remember, for example, sitting up one night on guard outside my parents' room to protect them from what I believed to be a genuine threat from the voices. Because I'd had such bad problems with self-injury, most of the cutlery in the house had been hidden. So I ended up arming myself with this plastic fork, like picnic wear, and literally sat outside my parents' room the whole night clutching it 
you ready to sort of spring into action should anything happen. It was literally like, don't mess with me, I've got, I've got a plastic fork. Don't you know? Um, now, a later, more a strategic response is to dispense with the plastic fork and instead try to deconstruct the message behind the words. So when the voices warn me not to leave the house, then I would thank them for drawing my attention to how unsafe I felt because if I was aware of it, then I could do something positive about it. But would then go on to reassure both them and myself that we were safe and didn't need to feel frightened anymore. I would set boundaries for the voices and try to interact with them in a way that was assertive yet respectful, establishing a slow process of communication and collaboration in which we could learn to work together and support one another. And throughout this process, possibly one of the greatest revelations was when I realised that the most hostile, aggressive voices actually represented the parts of me that had been hurt the most profoundly. And as such, it was these voices that needed to be shown the greatest compassion and care. Now, it was armed with this knowledge that I would ultimately gather together my shattered self, each fragment represented by a different voice, gradually withdraw from all my medication and return to psychiatry, only this time from the other side. Ten years after that voice first came, I finally graduated, this time with the highest degree in psychology the university had ever given, and one year later, the highest master's, which I always say isn't bad for a mad woman. In fact, uh, one of the voices actually dictated the answers during the exam, which technically possibly counts as cheating. Um, I worked at mental health services, I spoke at conferences, I published book chapters and academic articles, but I argued and continue to do so the relevance of the following concept. An important question in psychiatry shouldn't be what's wrong with you, but rather what's happened to you. And all the while, I listened to my voices, with whom I'd finally learned to live with peace and respect, and which in turn reflected a growing sense of compassion, acceptance and respect towards myself. And I remember the most moving and extraordinary moment when supporting another young woman who was terrorised by her voices and becoming fully aware for the very first time that I was no longer in that position myself, but was finally able to support someone else who was. I'm now very proud to be a part of InterVoice, the organisational body of the International Hearing Voices Movement, an initiative inspired by the work of Professor Marius Rom and Dr Sandra Escher, which locates voice hearing as a survival strategy, a sane reaction to insane <coughs> circumstances. Not an aberrant symptom of schizophrenia to be endured, but a complex, significant and meaningful experience to be explored. Together, we envisage and, under, and, and act a society that understands and respects voice hearing, which uh, respects the needs of individuals who hear voices and which values them as full citizens. This type of society is not only possible, I believe it is already on its way. Because to paraphrase Chavez, once social change begins, it cannot be reversed. You cannot humiliate the person who feels pride. You cannot oppress the people who are not afraid anymore. For me, the achievements of the Hearing Voices movement are a reminder that empathy, fellowship, justice, respect are more than words. They are convictions and beliefs, and that beliefs can change the world. In the last 20 years, the movement has established Hearing Voices networks in 26 countries across five continents, working together to promote dignity, empowerment and solidarity for individuals in mental distress, to create a new language and practice of hope, which, at its very centre, lies an unshakable belief in the power and resilience of the individual. As Peter Levine has said, the human animal is a unique being endowed with an instinctual capacity to heal and the intellectual spirit to harness this innate capacity. For members of society, there is no greater honour or privilege than in facilitating that process of healing for someone, to bear witness, to reach out a hand, to share the burden of someone suffering and to hold the hope for their recovery. And likewise, for survivors of distress and adversity, it's important that we remember that we don't have to live our lives forever defined by the damaging things that have happened to us. We are unique, we are irreplaceable, what lies within us can never be truly colonised, contorted or taken away. The light never, ever goes out. Or as a very wonderful psychiatrist once said to me, don't tell me what other people have told you about yourself, tell me about you. Now, in fact, this kind of holistic, person-centred framework would likewise be an excellent motto for the Hearing Voices movement and the work of Roman Escher that inspired it. Its emphasis is on supporting people to make sense of what's happening to them, to listen to their stories, to explore what their beliefs mean to them, to offer input in working towards healing. 
Everyone is credited with unique wisdom, insight and expertise about the nature of their own experience. No one is told their beliefs are wrong, no one is turned away and no one is believed to be too ill to benefit. The Hearing Voices movement recognises, of course, that hearing voices can be intensely distressing and overwhelming. This isn't about romanticising the experience, but it is about seeing it as a significant and interpretable event that can be deciphered and understood, an opportunity for learning and growth, even if the lessons are painful and difficult, rather than the traditional view of voice hearing as just a pathological symptom, completely devoid of context. As such, we emphasise the substantial research, this recent meta-analysis being just one of many, many examples that links psychosis and schizophrenia generally, and voice hearing specifically, with life conflicts and difficulties. Likewise, we emphasise the overwhelming physical similarities between the impact of trauma on the brain and the neurological abnormalities evident in schizophrenia. This is a truly, genuinely integrated biopsychosocial model, which does not see these kind of changes as indicative of a carnivorous disease process, rather as the result of the impact of stressful environmental events on us as holistic human beings. Correspondingly, Intervoice very strongly questions and critiques the current dominance of therapeutic models that are derived solely from biomedical and biogenetic understandings. However, Intervoice is not an anti-psychiatry or anti-psychology movement. Um, rather, we emphasise the importance of positive fellowship and alliance between voice hearers, friends, family members and mental health professionals of all disciplines. And this actually formed a debate last year on the Huffington Post with Professor Alan Francis, who was the chairman of the DSM-4 task force. DSM basically is the mothership of psychiatry, um, which reiterated that the tenets of Intervoice is not anti-psychiatry. Rather, it's about propagating good information, informed choice, and treating mental health service users as active partners in seeking solutions. And likewise, Intervoice recognises that its own approach doesn't appeal to everyone. We see that every single recovery journey is extremely unique and for that reason really try to avoid advocating for restrictive one-size-fits-all models or solutions. In fact, Intervoice isn't really about a specific therapeutic approach. At its heart, it's about solidarity, social justice and supporting people who hear voices in developing positive identities and a sense of pride and empowerment. However, we do propagate a broad and diverse range of strategies for holistic coping and whole life recovery. And to give just one example for voice hearing is a method of psychological formulation called the construct. Now, I'm going to do that slightly obnoxious thing where you obsessively reference all your own work, but I've got a PowerPoint and a captive audience, so I guess I may as well. Um, the construct was a concept developed by Marius Rom and Sandra Escher as a very open yet systematic way of exploring and interpreting the links between voice content, voice characteristics and experienced adversity in the life of the voice hearer. Essentially, this is about deconstructing voice hearing as a symptom and reconstructing it as an individual experience that occurred in a very specific, subjective, psychological and social context. As such, a very crucial, important part of this kind of approach is learning ways not only to cope with the voices themselves, which perhaps is something that medication may do, but to also try and understand the distressing emotions and life events that are implicated in the onset and maintenance of the voices. Now, to crack that code, to try and understand the meaning and relevance of someone's voice hearing experience, five main themes are examined, and we're going to um, explore those in one moment. But all five of these themes are premised on the idea that voice hearing is personally significant to the person who hears the voices and is in some way related to, their as to aspects of their life history. And we use this information to answer two key questions about representation in order to formulate a construct. Firstly, the idea that voices are almost inevitably, not always, don't want to overgeneralise, but in the vast majority of cases, what we found is that they are related to personally significant individuals in the person's life in either a literal or a metaphorical way, and that includes the voice hearer themselves. And secondly, a question that goes to the absolute heart of the voice hearing experience. And the answer to this kind of question generally tends to be 
events, problems and situations that were so overwhelming they exceeded the ability to cope. Now, probably the easiest way to demonstrate this way of working is with a genuine example. And this is the example of Kate, obviously not her real name, who was 21 at the time, who had 12 voices and who had been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Now, the first area of inquiry of the five themes is voice identity. And just to emphasise, of course, it goes without saying that this is just an example. Not everyone's voices are the same. Not everyone's voices will fit this model in a particular way. But it's a guiding framework for the kind of things we would be thinking about when doing a construct. Identity is things like name, age and gender. And we would do this for each voice that the person hears. So for Kate, there's a male voice called the devil. That voice is 22 years old. Not everyone's voices have specific ages, but these voices did. Aurora, a female voice, 40 years old. The demons, a group of indiscriminate 10 voices, no gender, no name, no ages. Note how old the female voice is and how old Kate is, because even that scrap of information, there is already clues as to what is really going on here. Second query, the characteristics of the voices. What do they actually say? Are they malicious? Are they benevolent? Is there a hierarchy between them? Do they remind you of anyone you know? Has anyone else spoken to you that way before? Is their tone or their content familiar? The devil, as you can probably guess by the name, a very typical menacing and aggressive voice, commanding, very frightening and overwhelming. Aurora, the complete opposite, a very kind, benevolent and supportive voice, provided advice and reassurance. And the demons, very belittling, threatening and offensive. The voices of the devil and Aurora were aware of each other but never interacted. Um, the demons and the devil, however, did interact, so Aurora sort of existed almost quite separately from them. The third question, triggers. What situations, emotions or people provoke the voices and how do the voices respond? What we found is that the devil was constantly present. There was no particular trigger, although we did find that it, he was worse when Kate was angry. And this does suggest that this is a voice that is in some way related to feelings of anger. Aurora, on the other hand, triggered by feelings of sadness or loneliness. So this is a voice with quite a different emotional resonance and meaning. And the demons appeared to be linked to social anxiety in some way because they were immediately triggered during any kind of social interaction or when Kate was experiencing a sense of guilt or shame. Fourthly, the history of the voices, which for me I think is one of the most important queries. What was happening in the person's life when each voice appeared for the first time? And how did the voices change after that in terms of content or influence? And in Kate's case, the following story emerged. Although she'd come to the attention of psychiatric services in her early 20s, these voices had actually been around for much, much longer than that. They'd first come when she was eight years old, and contrary to the way they manifested now, when they first came, they were actually very positive. Aurora was named after the heroine in the film Sleeping Beauty to reflect this sense of serenity and gentleness. You notice at the beginning that this voice was immediately identified as being 19 years older than Kate was, and it turned out the voice had always been 19 years older. So the voice aged as Kate aged. The devil was not always the devil. The devil, as it turned out, was originally called Bobby, um, named after a character in the Dungeon and Dragons children's cartoon, and was a very, very playful, cheerful character. So immediately, of course, then the relevant question is, what happened to make this sudden dramatic change in the voices? And what happened is that a year ago, Kate had been sexually assaulted. At this point, the voices of Aurora completely withdrew, and the voice of Bobby became extremely malicious and threatening and not long afterwards was renamed the devil as opposed to Bobby. The demons had begun nine months ago after Kate had been rejected by a man whom she'd been very attracted to. His friends were very bullying and uh, humiliating towards her. And these voices, the demons, have always been negative. And our fifth and final area of inquiry, again, hugely, hugely important, the person's unique biography, which inevitably, whether vo and this doesn't obviously just apply to voice hearing, but to any kind of experience, communicates vital information about the course and content of distress. And for our purposes, we want to know what happened in this person's life before they heard voices. 
And it turned out that Kate, from very early age, had been extremely academically gifted. Um, this brought privileges as well as penalties because she felt very isolated from her peers as a result. She was lonely, she didn't have many friends, but along came the voices who acted as a source of companionship um, and reassurance. She was and remained extremely close to her father, had a difficult relationship with her mother. This isn't, of course, blaming Kate's mother, but just exploring the emotional dynamics in the family. Mum was quite intimidating, quite emotionally remote. She loved her daughter, but found that quite difficult to express in a sort of tactile or warm way. Um, and Kate, uh, throughout all infancy and childhood, was never encouraged or permitted to express strong emotions or to stand up for her needs. So when deriving our construct, I'm sure people, I can see people sort of nodding and smiling when I'm talking, I'm sure people have already got a very clear idea of where this is going. Remember also that this is a woman who was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, who had been offered medication and not offered any kind of psychological therapy. The childhood companions, as when the voices first arrived, is very, very, very typical um, of children with rich fantasy lives who start to hear voices, the less pathologizing term could just be imaginary friends often as a result of either being literally physically isolated or finding it very difficult to relate to people around them. It's a very common experience. Um, the female voice, 19 years older than Kate. Can anyone guess how many years older than Kate, Kate's actual mother was? 19 years. Um, this voice, right from the beginning, was compensating for the, the absence of a warm maternal figure. It's a very ingenious and creative strategy. The male, on the other hand, were complete opposite, very boisterous, a good playmate. The change in the voices came after a very overwhelming traumatic incident, at which point the protective and reassuring voice, Aurora, disappeared. The devil and the demons are associated with anger, the sense that the world is a bad place, with guilt, which is anger at yourself, and with shame, the idea that everybody sees how bad I am. The demons are representative of this group of bullying, rejecting peers, and on the other hand, the devil is partly, not wholly, but partly influenced by Kate's attacker. So, very closely linked to that, what problems may the voices represent? On one hand, Kate's powerlessness and isolation as a child, and on the other, the unresolved trauma, which created unbearably negative, intolerable feelings. Both this external source of aggression and Kate's own negative self-image are embodied in the voices. So basically, through this approach, we've already devised ourselves a kind of stress of vulnerability model. We've examined what are the emotional vulnerabilities may have been that created Kate as sort of more likely to hear voices, and what was the chronic stressor, um, the chronic crisis that made that change in the voices happen. And with this information, we now, and did, have enough impetus to derive a recovery plan, not a treatment plan, a recovery plan. And this classically follows a three-stage model of healing and recovery, which is guided by the first of establishing safety, so we find ways of coping with the most challenging aspects of the voices. Secondly, making sense of one's experiences, so using the voices as clues to internal emotional conflicts that can be understood and channeled in new ways. And finally, social reconnection, working through events that have been difficult to understand and accept and moving towards the future. Now, we recently decided to see how applicable this approach actually is. Um, and what we found, as expected, of course, it's not somebody that's something that suits everyone. Not everyone wants to work in this way. But what we did find in the vast majority of cases, it is perfectly possible to formulate clear links between voice content, voice characteristics, and experienced adversity in the life of the voice hearer. And what's even more important is that the inf this information can be clinically applied in ways that serve recovery. So this piece of research was with 100 individuals. 80% had been diagnosed with so-called schizophrenia spectrum disorders. And the average length of voice hearing was 18 years. So this was your quintessential so-called chronic schizophrenia sample. At least one form of childhood trauma was reported by 89%. Again, no surprise there. And in terms of our first representational query, who or what do the voices represent, this was clearly apparent in 78% of cases, most commonly aspects of self, a family member, or a past abuser, a perpetrator of some kind. What problems do the voices represent? Apparent in 94% of cases commonly low self-worth, anger, shame and guilt. And if you're wondering about the people, um, the percentage who, for whom these two questions weren't apparent, 
in actually it was far higher than those numbers it was but the reason that we didn't include it was because the voice hearer themselves didn't agree with our formulation and as far as we're concerned with this way of working it's only as sort of efficacious and truthful as the individual voice hearer deems it to be. So if Kate, if I'd done that formulation for Kate and Kate had then turned around and said, actually, I don't agree with any of that, I might think it's true. If Kate doesn't, then it's, it's not a useful construct. So just to emphasise that actually, in terms of objective links, it was actually even higher than that. But this is just the percentage that people agreed with. But what we found is that it is clearly both possible and productive to engage in an exploration of ab uh, vulnerabilities and vulnerabilities and adversities with people who hear voices. Um, and that for so many people, and this was the really heartbreaking thing about doing this piece of research, is that these were lived narratives that had been obscured for years and years and years behind the schizophrenia label, behind the patient role, behind the pessimistic implications of a disease model of voice hearing. And as an aside, if you want to see an excellent sort of demonstration in cinema of this process of sort of metaphor for an unbearable reality is watch this film, Mysterious Skin. Um, what this movie is about is that it charts the two very different ways um, that two boys who were both sexually abused by their football coach try and come to terms with their experience. Um, Neil sort of attempts to take back power by becoming a sex worker, whereas Brian retreats into a reclusive fantasy about alien abduction. And Brian's narrative was particularly interesting to me um, because I think in real life it is not unlikely that he would have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, just as I was. Um, because he has traumatic amnesia for the abuse itself, um, he constructs a belief that his memories of waking up um, covered in blood and with sort of no knowledge of what had happened in the few hours previously, as well as his memory of seeing himself being touched by this glowing blue hand, must be explicable in terms of alien abduction. And as he grows into adulthood, retrains this belief that has a sort of very negative impact on his life. It's only upon meeting Neil um, as an adult that he comes to realise that that memory of the glowing blue hand was in fact the hand of the football coach that had be looked blue because of this eerie blue light glowing in from the window from the garden outside. So again, I would reiterate what I said before really, that the key question as far as I'm concerned for the Bryans of the world, the real life Bryans, innumerable, is not what's wrong with you, but rather what's happened to you. And again, I think this is sort of neatly captured in the following model, which is certainly one that I relate to and one that I think is true for many, too many people. Not everyone, of course, but for many of us. The nature of the emotional crisis is responded to with denial in the sense that the role and influence of painful life events and subsequently the emotional meaning, symbolism and relevance of experience like voice hearing is minimised. Insight is defined as accepting the reality of your mental illness, you have a brain disease. Recovery is often conceptualised as just trying to control symptoms, and if you have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, that's almost inevitably done with medication. And subsequently, the risk of relapse runs very high because the social and emotional problems underlying these experiences never get resolved. This, plus stigma, exclusion, helplessness, humiliation, very negative side effects from medication conspire to create this vicious circle in which the original crisis is more likely to reoccur. On the contrary, I think for many of us, um, true, uh, the true recovery response is about understanding and accepting and integrating the emotional meaning of what our experiences mean to us. Um, I think for so many people, and obviously you've heard about my own personal experience, but also in my professional experience, what I've seen time and time again is that a true understanding of distress requires a rediscovery of the past. So often we need to understand the past if we're going to reclaim the present and the future. And for many of us, what that involves is a true exploration of the subjective meaning of our experiences and using that very valuable information to guide and inform genuine healing and genuine growth. 
Because the amount of evidence in the past decade has now proved beyond any reasonable doubt that experiences that get labelled as psychosis and as schizophrenia are causally related to a broad range of challenging, traumatic and adversarial events and different combinations of these. Um, for me, I think this kind of research is a real clear call to arms that mental health professionals have a moral responsibility to engage in suffering, to bear witness to the experiences of loss, injustice, oppression, trauma that have shaped their clients' lives. And this isn't a formulation that prohibits the use of biological strategies like medication. Medication can have a useful role for many people. But what it is about is emphasising the importance of using medication as just one aspect of a very integrated intervention that seeks to address people's social and psychological and emotional wounds in a very healing and restorative way. Um, for me, as you can probably tell, I have a lot of anger around this issue and I think that when we see the way that mental health services and in society more generally operates a lot of the time, um, the sort of medicalisation of human misery I think is one of the greatest errors and human rights abuses of the past 20th century and as far as I'm concerned, the stigmatisation, the silence and the oppression of people who experience extreme mental distress has absolutely no place in a civilised and enlightened society. It belongs in a museum. And let us hope that that is where it is going to end up. And of course, we need hope. Hope is very, very important. Um, and in this respect, I want to take this presentation right back to where it began, which is with the work of the Hearing Voices movement. Because in mental health, there are groups perceived as great medical organisations or great therapy organisations or organisations that excel in research. But to me, the Hearing Voices movement is a great humanitarian organisation that reaches out across the world. I first encountered it as a traumatised, demoralised patient and through it discovered aspirations that transcended notions of damage and deficit and diagnosis and instead outlined a framework where personally defined recovery was deemed not only possible but inevitable and available to everyone. I think this is a very very important message um, because by uh, incorporating much more cooperative and humanistic and meaning making elements into therapeutic work whether that's in the formal role of a mental health professional or the role of a friend um, whose peer has suddenly started to hear voices, is by bearing, holding this hope that people can be supported to recover, people can be supported to have a valuable life that the voices become part of, people can be supported to listen to their voices without anguish, and the personal meaning of the voices can be explored and can be reintegrated into a previously fractured sense of self. Thank you very much. We might have to share. Oh, well, something's happening. Something's happening. Uh, thank you, Emma. That was a, a very powerful um, uh, story and a relation of your uh, your um, your research to your own experiences. Um, uh, we've time for some questions. Does anybody uh, anybody like to ask Eleanor a, a question? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm a GP, and um, I've always been interested in psychiatry, and I, I quite like. The idea that there's the practical aspects, you know, the political side of it as well. Okay. Uh, I always imagined that when I looked after people who heard voices, which we might have potentially diagnosed as schizophrenia, that if their function was okay and their happiness was okay, mm. then it was not an inappropriate thing. <coughs> but the numbers of people in the acute phase of such presentation um, is, is low often. And then when you start looking at them with the model that we've got about treatment, you know, and keeping them at least comfortable in some way, we don't have a political uh, uh, will to invest in any type of therapy that supports them in any other way. Right. Not just for this condition, for any condition. We don't have supportive services. So we're really going to struggle uh, whether this model is true or not, it's hard to imagine that anyone's going to invest a lot of money into it. Um, not yours, but any, any 
Yeah. No, no, I, I, no, I hear what you're saying, and that's obviously sort of like healthcare cuts. Um, the way that services are just being slashed left, right, and centre is absolutely is an enormous problem. Um, and I think what's also frustrating is the amount of money that is also spent on pharmaceuticals. Um, of which the evidence base is, is negligible at best, and we also know that they actually do real harm. Um, what I would say, and I think the concern you raise is absolutely valid, um, is utilising the voluntary sector. Um, Intervoice is a charity. We have no money. Um, we literally we run on an absolute shoestring. The only um, money we have is voluntary donations on our website. Um, I, like every sort of single person involved with Intervoice, does gives their time for free and voluntarily. Um, so it's sort of drawing with existing structures that are already in place, and I think that was what, I'd, you know, if people sort of having the same concerns, it's like, but what's out there for people? Where can people go? Um, go on the Intervoice website, and also through there you can find a link for the English Hearing Voices Network. Um, there are over 180 self-help groups attached to the Hearing Voices Network. I'm pretty certain there's one in Leeds. There's certainly one in Bradford. Um, and this is the kind of, you know, the idea of like things like constructs, like making sense of voices, sharing coping strategies, um, becoming sort of more empowered and accepting of the experiences. It's all the kind of things that happen in Hearing Voices groups. So certainly as a, you know, a short term solution um, is linking in with the Hearing Voices Network, going on into voice websites, seeing what's already out there. Um, I think that's, you know, in, in these times of austerity, it's really important to sort of get creative about the, the type of resources and support that we are able to offer to people. What, what struck me about your, um, your message was uh, when we talk about stigma, quite often what we're talking about is the, the views of the ill-informed or uninformed people around mental health. Mm. Yet some of your experiences, this was from within the mental health profession. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the, that sort of message of pes pessimism and pathology around experiences that get labelled as schizophrenia and psychosis is, is absolutely a real problem. Um, I should emphasise as well that, that, you know, that is just my experience in one mental health trust, you know, quite a few years ago. And, you know, I do a lot of work. I no longer work in the NHS myself, but I do do sort of teaching and training in the NHS. And I've seen countless examples of really, really wonderful practice. Um, for me, I think it's more about sort of good individuals stuck in a very overworked system. And, and this isn't just sort of like limited to the NHS, but I think much more sort of internationally. I mean, say like the United States is even worse. Um, it's the wrong model. It's a very, very, very biological model that um, compares mental distress to physical somatic distress in a way that simply is not justified, is not evidence-based and isn't working. Um, Again, I don't. I sound like I'm sort of really ha targeting psychiatrists, which is not my intention. The Intervoice is founded by a psychiatrist. Meredith Rom is a psychiatrist. Obviously, psychiatrists do some absolutely amazing work. Um, but I think that mental health services are not trauma-based. They are biology-based at the moment in many, many instances. And again, this is sort of limiting and this is problematic. And it means that things like so, uh, <coughs> therapy, psychotherapy, peer support, um, psychosocial support is not quite as readily available because the budget's not extended towards it, and I think that's that's really unhelpful. Um, but on a more positive note, I think the times they are a changing. Um, I was invited last year to speak at the Royal College of Psychiatry um, at their sort of an annual congress in London, um, which felt like quite a progressive thing because obviously you've heard me, you see that you know I'm not a psychiatry's best friend. Um, and I'm quite critical and quite outspoken about what I perceive as some of the limitations. And they, with you know, an open heart and an open mind, invited me to give a keynote speech. And I think that's something that probably wouldn't have happened as little as five years ago. I think there is sort of a much more... And, and really because the evidence is now too strong to deny the evidence that, you know, as my um, colleague at Liverpool, Professor John Reid, says, bad shit happens to people and it drives them mad. Um, it's as simple and as complicated as that. Um, John is the author of the traumagenic model of psychosis that you saw earlier. Um, and, you know, he's, he's believed that very, very strongly for years and years and years. And I think, certainly from my personal and professional experience, believe that too. Um, but also believe that people should be given the choice to understand their experiences in the way that makes absolute best sense for them. And that's it in a nutshell, albeit an absolutely massive one to your very sensible question. Um, Thank you. We, 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 we have, have a, we got a couple more minutes. If you okay. anybody go else have a question, so we go over here. I'll try and give a microphone to you. Just pass that back. Hi. 
It is. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to ask. I had to walk out because um, I'm an inpatient, and I'm going to have quite a lot of voices behind me. Um, I had to walk out because when it's talked about. And when it's mentioned, it makes me really laugh for me. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you'd had any experiences of that or any tips. Um, I mean, in terms of that I want and I need to overcome. Um, I think because there are some questions that I would sort of need to ask you to be able to answer that, and perhaps it might be better for us to do that privately yeah. afterwards, if, if that's OK. That. I'm absolutely happy to oh, do that. Um, so we could sort of talk about that privately. Um, but to uh, kind of answer your question, it's silly, because I know it maybe I think this is a very, very polite audience, because what people nearly always ask me is, do you still hear voices? <laughs> um, <laughs> and the answer is yes. Um, and I was hearing voices when I did that talk because they often all remind me what to say. So if that's another question people were sort of thinking, like, how does she remember all that? It's partly because the voices will act as prompts. Um, that's sort of quite an extraordinary position because obviously you heard the first part of that talk, like how absolutely demoralised and overwhelmed and terrorised and tormented I was. I literally wanted to die you know death seemed more preferable than living with these incessant tormentors and that relationship has absolutely transformed and i can tell you completely honestly that if the voices went well i'd be out of a job for starters um i would miss them they're really valued and important part of my life now um and sometimes they can still be negative so you know they, they can be angry they can be sort of undermining at times but the difference now is that I will look at that and sort of think, what's, what's that about? Why are the voices feeling like that? Because, of course, that means I'm feeling like that, but just maybe aren't quite fully aware of it. And I engage with it, and they provide me with an enormous amount sort of emotional wisdom and, and insight um, that I really sort of cherish. You know, again, it, it feels like that, you know, I can genuinely stand in front of you today and say I am proud to be a voice hearer. Um, I have sort of no sense of, of shame about that. Um, that talk that you saw at the beginning, um, I did in California last year. It's, I don't know if people have heard of the TED conferences. Um, and this was this sort of very surreally star-studded audience. So like Bill Gates was there, Bono was there, um, Jim Carrey was there, Ben Affleck introduced my session. I had my microphone put on with Ben Affleck. Ben Affleck <coughs> laughed at my bad schizophrenia jokes. I feel like my work in this field is done. Um, so this is like very, very, very out of my comfort zone. There's like, you know, sort of almost two, nearly 2,000 people in this big auditorium. And at the end, and this talk, if people would like to use that talk as a teaching resource, please do. It's freely available online. Um, TED.com. Um, at the end, before I left the stage, the, the MC came up to me and asked me, do you still hear voices? And again, this is in front of this enormous audience. And there was very briefly a bit of me that wanted to sort of play it down, you know, be a bit more normal and say, oh, no, not that much now. And I, and I thought, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the truth and say, yeah, I hear them all the time. Um, and I also said to her, they were, I heard them during the talk, they reminded me what to say. Um, and I feel so sort of fortunate and privileged that I've been able to reclaim my experience, voice hearing, um, voice hearing which emerged in very, very traumatic circumstances as a response to overwhelming experience that held that emotion for so many years that I can now sort of see that as an as a experience that I have pride, uh, pride about. And so many people right now out there are made to feel ashamed about it, they're stigmatised, they're pathologised, they're misunderstood, they're not giving that opportunity to make peace with their own experience. And I think that is absolutely something that has to change. Um, and I would sort of respectfully ask anybody who sort of agrees with me, if you would consider going to Intervoice, um, going, becoming a member, it's only about sort of 4 99 or giving us a one-off donation so that we can keep sort of spreading this message and keep offering this kind of help and support to people. Okay, time for one quick question, if, if we can. Just speak. Just press the button. Next one, green. Oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a practitioner psychologist. I'm an academic here as well in psychology. I have uh, looked up to hear quite a lot of things from you that uh, in this day and age, a young, uh, uh, younger practitioner in mental health field is actually anti medical model. 
after teaching for, for two decades now, as a practitioner, then I slowly became an academic. And I have been teaching um, against the medical model in my uh, uh, both the uh, as, uh, originally when I was training psychologists and now undergraduates and postgraduates in, uh, in psychology. The, the, the thing that I have is some of the students, even though they're studying psychology, have to hold on to our logical model uh, in order to become, uh, you know, to validate uh, the scientific credentials. <coughs> and, and that's uh, pro problematic at best, but uh, it can, I think, trying to get people to look at psycho psychological disturbance by a psychological mm. understanding is very difficult now. Yeah, absolutely. Um so there's, there's a sort of several answers to that. Firstly, thank you for your kind comment. I'm not actually that young. I've just had a hard life. It's age me. Um, <laughs> um, no, I think you make a very, very important point. And I think it, it's very important to sort of get creative about this, get challenging, um, draw on the considerable evidence base that is already out there to use in our work. Um, things like the uh, traumagenic model of psychosis is a great example of a genuinely integrated biopsychosocial approach. Um, the tenets of this kind of way of working absolutely does not exclude biology. We are biological beings. Um, there would have been profound changes in my brain when I was in that sort of acute crisis that I told you about at the beginning. Um, my difficulty with the current model is the way that it insists on looking at those changes out of context. And this is actually, there is very, very legitimate and compelling scientific let alone humane and ethical rationales for, for ending that. Because to, to give a very quick example, say if we look at a group of people who are bereaved, um, and we do brain scans on them, and we would absolutely see that their neurochemistry has been altered. Now, do we say that that neurochemistry is causing them to cry? Or do we say that it's the loss of the loved one that is causing them to cry? Or do we put the two together and say, ah, oh, this happened, and this has happened, and this is the response? You know, obviously, it's a bit of a no-brainer. With psychosis and schizophrenia, there is a whole corpus of brain scanning research that does not ask about life events. So we have a sample of people with you know, atrophy, with dopamine irregularities, um, so on and so forth. You saw it all on that slide. And we don't ask what's happened to this group of people to cause these differences. We just do a complete reverse causality. There is no equivalent in any other branch of medicine that does this um, that then says, well, that's a carnivorous brain disease rather than actually thinking what's happened environmentally, emotionally, psychosocially, to cause these groups of people's brains to function in a different way. Um, and also, what can we do to change that again? Because there was wonderful research about the importance of attachment, secure attachment, restorative relationships that undo that kind of damage. The, the, well, damage. Um, you know, the human brain is this, again, that Peter Levine quote, the human animal is a unique being endowed with an instinctual capacity to heal and the intellectual spirit to harness this innate capacity. That's the kind of research that I would like to be see do. Um, a, a, a meaningful um, and engaged synthesis of the social, the biological, the psychological, the interpersonal. Um, this, is, this is actually a better way of, I think to me, that's actually better science. Um, but no, you're, you're absolutely right. We should exchange email addresses and link in because it's always good to meet uh, like-minded allies in the field. But I'm going to now put, you can't, give me a microphone, you can't get it off me with a gun. Um, but thank you so much for your questions and your presence and your attention. And I hope you very much enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. It's fascinating. We're going to have a, a, a change of pace now. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Mark Williams, who's going to talk to us about mindfulness um, from, from theory to, to practice. Um, uh, sorry, Prof Professor, Professor Mark Williams, Emeritus Professor of Clinical Psychology and the Honorary Senior Research Fellow at the Depart Department of Psychiatry and was Director of the Oxford, Oxford Mindfulness Centre until his retirement in 2013. He's the Fellow of the British Psychological Society, the Academic of, Acad Academy of Medical Scientists, the British Academy and the US Association for Psychological Scient Science. Professor Williams, along with his colleagues John Teasdale from Cambridge and Zindel Seagal from Toronto, developed mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for prevention of relapse and recurrence in major depression. 
His research is concerned with psychological models and treatment of depression and suicidal behaviour, particularly the application of experimental cognitive psychology to understand the processes that increase risk of suicidal behaviour in depression. I'd like to introduce Professor Mark Williams. Thank you. So, um, my brief this afternoon is to talk a bit about mindfulness, and we could talk a lot about it, but probably one way to get into it is actually to do some straight away. Um, so, uh, if you're willing to uh, play along, then let's do a short, brief, one or two minute meditation. Um, so, lower your gaze, perhaps, or you can close your eyes if you like, and if, you, if it's possible, see if you can put both feet on the ground so you can actually feel the ground. And, of course, if you don't want to do this, that's fine. Nobody else knows what you're doing. So, if you want to go to sleep, that's also fine. And see if it's possible now to put your attention down in your feet. So, taking the spotlight of attention down into the feet and see what you notice when your attention gets there. What does your attention find? There may be tingling, pins and needles, warmth. So this is not thinking about the feet so much as noticing from the inside, the experience, moment by moment. and then allowing that attention to expand to the legs. So from the feet, right up the calves, calf muscles, shin bones, including the knees and the thighs, until you notice the contact with the chair, whatever you're sitting on. What sensations are here? And then allow the attention to expand again to the, to the upper torso, so the hips and the abdomen and up the chest, and then the arms as well, including the arms and hands, and then the neck and head. So that now, see if it's possible to hold the whole body in awareness, just as it is. Now, we're not trying to achieve any special state, so if you can't relax, that's fine. Just noticing how you are right now, sort of taking, taking the temperature of the body, if you will, or noticing the weather pattern in the body. Agitated, sleepy, restless, relaxed, whatever it is, see if it's possible to allow it to be exactly as you find it. beginning to move fingers and toes, and if your eyes have been closed, letting them open again and taking in the room again. So one of the things we notice about mindfulness is it's really quite simple. That is, there's nothing there about noticing that, first of all, you have something called attention, like this sort of searchlight of attention. Uh, secondly, that you can direct it in certain ways. You can direct it to various places in the room, um, or you can direct it inside the body, and then you can direct it in very particular ways, particular parts of the body, and you can expand it. There's like a, a bit of a zoom lens on it as well. So it can be very, very narrowly focused, or it can be very, very open and very broad. So already you can notice that quality of attention. You may also notice that although it's really simple to begin to direct your attention in certain parts of the body or the world, but actually often, I don't know whether you notice this, the mind wanders. So that 
it's usually only a few seconds after you start this sort of little meditation episode, and your mind goes on to perhaps what you're supposed to do when you finished here, or what you did this morning, or maybe what am I doing here? I thought I was going to hear a lecture. This is weird. Uh, how soon can I get out of here? Uh, whatever. And the mind then goes off on a trip on its own. And actually, when that happens, it turns out that that is really helpful, because what this mindfulness meditation practice is all about is noticing the patterns of the mind, but with some sort of anchor on the breath or the body or something, some anchor which means that there's just a chance that you'll notice eventually that the mind has gone and that it isn't where you had intended it to be. And then there's the resolution, OK, well, let's just bring it back. And that going away and coming back is actually what the practice is about. It's not about clearing the mind, getting relaxed or whatever. It's about finding an anchor and then being able to look and see clearly the patterns of the mind from that anchor. Some people have likened it to um, trying to steady a boat. Sometimes if you're trying to look at the stars through a telescope or a, or, or a binoculars, um, it's rather difficult to do if you're on the open sea or a lake on a rowing boat because you wouldn't be able to hold the thing still. You wouldn't get to see very much. So if you could anchor it or if you could even draw the boat up onto the beach so it's solid, then there's a chance that when you look you'll see more distinctly. And so in a sense, mindfulness is about steadying attention so that you can see more clearly the patterns of the mind. And then there's a greater chance it'll, chance it'll enable us to do the sort of things that um, we've just heard about in, in Ella's talk about making peace with your experiences rather than being um, a victim of your experiences. And it's that shift I want to talk about a little bit and how mindfulness might help in it. So what is mindfulness? I'll talk first of all about the definition of it, and then I'll come to the way in which we've mostly been using it in our research and work that we've been doing, practical work at Oxford, which is to see how much or how little it can help people who've been recurrently depressed, and then try to understand <coughs> why it is that mindfulness might be helpful, as it seems to be, by focusing on things that um, are relatively automatic in the mind, which when brought into the light of mindfulness, people can see more clearly and have more choices about what happens uh, in the mind. Um, later on, we may talk about some of the evidence that we've collected on uh, why it works, how it works, and also some things about the particular uh, group of people with particular experiences in the past in whom it seems to work very well. And that's another way in which it'll, it'll uh, tie up with the talk we've already heard. So first of all, then, the definition of mindfulness. I suppose at its simplest level, you could call it a training in attention. We've just discovered that you have an attention, and it can be directed in various ways. It's about training in attention, systematic training, and we tend to do this over eight weeks, and people practice every day, so that uh, distractions are not so distracting, so that especially compelling distractions that would take us away from what it, we had intended to be doing are not so compelling or distracting. And the use of it now in schools is, is particularly valued because uh, especially kids in schools, they have so many things that distract them that actually the business of just paying attention to one thing at a time is quite difficult. And in many of our jobs, we are asked to multitask. I was talking to someone from Goldman Sachs the other day in which he said he had four screens in front of him and that bottom screen was emails and the Goldman Sachs culture is you've got to answer an email within 30 seconds. But in the other screen were all the prices from around the world of various things, which you had to be vigilant for, because if you missed a trend, you might actually lose the company a lot of money or lose your clients a lot of money, even worse. Probably the same thing, actually. Um, so you had to attend to all these things. And multitasking was the, the, the nature of, the, of that job. And in fact, they would admire the people that could multitask the most in that setting. Some people were really good at actually doing that, it seemed. Um, but interestingly, although they'd learned to multitask, they'd forgotten how to single task, how to just do one thing at a time. And their partners often complained about that. Um, <laughs> in fact, if you want to know how you're doing, ask your partner. Don't ask yourself. Ask a good friend, and they'll tell you whether your multitasking is just getting on top of them, even if you think you're pretty good at it. <laughs> so training attention is the first thing. 
I think the second thing about uh, mindfulness is it's then using that attentional stability, a bit like pulling the rowing boat up onto the sand so you've got something stable, to use that attention stability to become aware of the sources of distraction, their nature, seeing their habitual patterns, seeing the signatures, seeing how we're reacting to them and how we have experiences, and then very soon afterwards we have a reaction to that experience, which actually can, can be something like, I don't like this, I want to get rid of it, and the reaction to it can actually make it worse than it orig originally was. So you can see that more clearly, but it's helpful to be attentionally stable to see it more clearly. And thirdly, learning to respond to these patterns of reactivity with greater wisdom and uh, 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 compassion, so that we don't respond to them as we tend to habitually do with lots of harsh judgment about what a bad person I am to even have these experiences, um, which for some reason doesn't quite help. It actually makes them intrude even more. So the sort of pull yourself together brigade, it doesn't tend to um, help very much. So in talking about why and how this is needful, my, I became aware of mindfulness, and particularly John Cabot's work in chronic pain, when my colleagues John Teasel and Zindel Segan and I had uh, uh, realized that one of the big problems in our field, which is uh, therapy for depression, was meeting a new problem that hadn't, we hadn't been aware of before. We'd been involved in doing research on cognitive therapy for depression, which turned out to be quite effective um, as effective as antidepressants, not necessarily more so or less so. And so people thought it was a sort of a settled deal. Cognitive therapy and indeed other therapies are quite good at alleviating the uh, symptoms of, if you take the medical model, or the experience of depression. Depression, the experience of depression, as you know, have these core features of sadness, hopelessness, on the one hand, sort of mood features. Uh, but it also had these core experiences of not being interested in things, not getting, having any get-up-and-go at all, especially for things that you once used to enjoy. They often have seemed the most aversive, the most difficult, and that's particularly painful, that your, your most valued hobbies and friends, now you don't want to see them, you don't want to do uh, anything uh, about that. But also another cluster of experiences around eating, around sleeping, problems, um, around feeling very agitated or slowed down, very tired a lot of the time, feeling guilty and worthless, not being able to concentrate, feeling suicidal. That cluster of experiences, when they co-occur, may get a diagnosis of clinical depression, when they co-occur and they stay around a long time. And typically they stay around between four, six or eight months at a time, then they get better by themselves, they spontaneously remit. Um, and that was the pattern until that we thought until the 60s and 70s that depression was episodic, they saw. And you have an episode and then it would get better spontaneously. The treatments then, the aim of treatment was to try and speed up the natural healing process. It was going to get better by itself, but if you used antidepressants or cognitive therapy, you'd get better maybe in 12 weeks rather than uh, take six months. So what was the new challenge then in the 80s and 90s? It was discovery that whereas depression tended in the early part of the 20th century and beyond, earlier than that, to be a sort of a problem mostly besetting people in late middle age, the age of onset of depression was getting younger and younger. So that by the time we looked at the data in the 1980s, people thought that there had been, probably people were now getting depressed in their 30s. By the 90s, it seemed to have slipped to, the, um, to even younger. And typically now, uh, the, the, the modal age of onset, that means the most common age at which depression, that cluster of symptoms and experiences that I described, the most common age when it starts is between 13 and 15 years old. And one of the consequences of that happening is, um, well, one consequence is that by 18 to 21, between half and 75% of people who are ever going to get depressed in their life have already been depressed once or twice. That's a huge change on notice, for example, by student mental health services or well-being services, that people are already coming to university or for postgraduate study or for their first job already with a, with a history that um, have very, very sort of difficult experiences to cope with. But the other consequence of it is that 
you begin to see now what the lifetime course of this cluster of, of experiences can, can give. And it looks as if that once you have one depression, the, a second one is about 50% likely. So you don't have to have, it's not inevitable there'll be another depression, uh, but uh, it may happen. But if you then have a second depression or a third, the likelihood of, of more actually goes up. And the, uh, as we've heard from Eleanor, a lot of these things happen with trauma. And maybe the first depression happens with a, a trauma or adversity. The second one needs less. The third one even needs less. But it, begun, it begins to get autonomous. That is, you don't need very much trauma later on to precipitate all these cluster of experiences again. So by the 1980s, people realized that the problem was not just depression needing to be treated when you were actually <coughs> depressed. It was, we need to understand what is it that keeps people at risk, even in between uh, an episode of depression, that makes the next episode more likely, and what can we do to, to help people become of lower risk. The analogy that sometimes used is, is the fire brigade. If you have a fire in your house and you call the fire brigade, they will come and put out the fire, and then you'll go away, they'll go away, and you'll never see them again, hopefully. If you had another fire, in, uh, 18 months after that, they would come, you'd shine 999, they'd put out the fire, hopefully no damage would have been done, maybe, and they'd go away again. If you had a third fire in 18 months, then they would start to wonder, and they might send a fire officer around to ask, What's going on in your house that means you're vulnerable to have fires? The fire officer would not come round in the middle of the blaze. That wouldn't, because they can't do an investigation in the middle of the blaze. What you need then is the fire brigade, maybe. Uh, you need the help for that particular episode. But then the fire officer would come and say, where's the vulnerability and can we somehow help to um, reduce that risk? And what my colleagues and I were looking for is a way of helping to reduce the risk of depression. So we invited people... Um, uh, in between episodes of depression, who we knew to be vulnerable because they'd had more, two, three, four, most of them, 75% had had three or more episodes of depression in the past. So we knew that the next 12 months, since they'd had the last episode rather recently, the next 12 months was going to be a critical time. And we went to see John Kabat-Zinn and asked him about his eight-week program that he developed for chronic pain, for mindfulness for chronic pain, mindfulness-based stress reduction, and adapted it for people who uh, were vulnerable for depression and, and offered it to them. But one of the startling things we found when we started this work was that people didn't actually know what the ongoing risk was. Why is it that people who've been depressed once get depressed again? So we had to look back in the psychology literature to look at our own research, to ask uh, people and, and, and allow all these sources of information to converge. And it begins to tell a very interesting story that these are normal processes of the mind that have somehow got hijacked by the difficult things that have happened. So there's nothing abnormal about uh, the mind in depression. These are normal processes that actually come online to try to help get over a sadness or a, a difficulty. But just because of the way the mind works, it tends to backfire. What do I mean by that? Well... Let's take a, an example from an old experiment that was done in the 1980s by some colleagues of mine that used to work with me at the Applied Psychology Unit in Cambridge, as it used to be called. Um, the Applied Psychology Unit was funded by the Medical Research Council to try to answer practical problems by the use of psychology. And one of the practical problems, because uh, it came partly from the Industrial Psychology Unit in, the, in, the war, in wartime, one of the practical problems they had then wasn't anything to do with depression at all. It was um, divers in the North Sea forgetting the information when they were down under the water fixing the rigs. So the North Sea was opening up, very, very big source of uh, e uh, economic good and benefit for Scotland and possibly the rest of the United Kingdom. The rest of the United Kingdom, maybe Scotland. Uh, so, but these divers were going down, forgetting the information they had to, they had to learn, they had to remember. So they called in the psychologist, the brave people, and they asked them, can, they, can you help us understand what's going on? Well, the obvious explanation is that you learn what you've got to do and all the serial numbers and this sort of thing on, on the dry land. Then you go down into really dark, murky depths. It's dark down there. And actually, who would remember that information? 
Um, it may be just be difficult. But they did an experiment to see, and they found that, yes, you did forget the information, but when you came back up on the beach, you remembered it again. And then they did the reverse experiment. They asked <coughs> divers to learn some material when they were underwater, which they could do, come on the beach, and guess what? They didn't rem remember it so well on the beach. So all the conditions of the beach were fine. When they went back underwater, they remembered it better. So you see the pattern that's emerging. Wherever you learn the information, you can recall it better when you get back into that situation. So learn it on the beach, forget it underwater. When you come back on the beach, you remember it again. Learn it underwater, come on the beach, you don't remember it so well, go back underwater, oh, it comes back to you. So this is a bit like going upstairs when you've forgotten something, yeah? And then forgetting what you've come for. What do you do? You have to go back downstairs. Then you get back into the kitchen and you remember it, yeah? You could yo-yo a long time doing that. <laughs> but generally speaking, you attend more and then you go back. So where you remember something, and of course, you know, going back to a childhood home that you haven't visited for years and years and years, you know, you suddenly remember stuff. Going back into the context brings back memories. Now, what's become apparent is that just like going back into the water for these divers made them remember what they'd learned underwater, going back to your childhood place makes you learn, or going upstairs, going downstairs, mood can act like that sort of context. Mood can act like that context. So when you get a little bit depressed, what happens is the sadness can bring with it all the things that you last remembered, thought, or was happening to you when you were last there. And if your first depression is, comes out in the context of bullying or trauma or difficulties or neglect, such as we were hearing earlier, then even if you get over it, if for some people, if they feel just a little bit sad, that's like diving back into the water. It can bring back the, not only the memories, but all the attitudes, all the sense of helplessness, all the sense of being bullied, of having no friends. So whether you're in your 20s or 30s or 40s, even if you've got lots of friends, what will happen is you'll be overwhelmed with the feeling that you have no friends. Overwhelmed with feelings that you're no good, that you're at the bottom of the heap, that nobody loves you, that you're outside the, the group. Um, and that that itself explains quite a lot of why depression keeps recurring, because Lots of experiments show that people who have been depressed once are more prone with little tiny bits of sadness for that sadness to bring back those full-blown things that were learned, experienced, and so on um, at, the, at the time uh, that um, the depression first started. So that sort of mood and memory phenomenon turns out to be really important. Now, we can do various things when that happens. And almost all of them turn out to be counterproductive. I mean, you can go and just blind yourself with alcohol. Not, not, you know, a little bit, fine, but too much just blots out a lot of other things that you might actually need to remember. Um, you could try and suppress the material coming back into your mind. But suppression doesn't always work either, as we know from the pink elephant experiments. You just tell somebody, for the next minute, do not think of a pink elephant. And guess what happens? Well, you found it yourself. If I tell you now, do not think of a pink elephant, then probably for the next minute, even if you conceded not thinking about pink elephant, as soon as the minute was up, you'd think of nothing else. So, and that's because you have to keep a note in your mind of what you're not supposed to be thinking about. Yes? Don't mention the war. Do you remember that? <laughs> um, it's the same thing. You know, whatever, if you keep a note of what you're not thinking about, you've already got a representation of that in your head. So suppression, alcohol, not very good. Now, there's another subtle thing, but this happens automatically. There's an experiment done by some Swedish psychologists on autobiographical memories for, uh, evoked by smells. Now, you know that smell is a very powerful um, bringer back of memories. So um, if I gave you the smell of mulled wine, for example, I mean, already you're thinking, oh, well, that's better than being here anyway. Um, the smell of mulled wine, or um, the smell of cloves, for example. Why these are all related to Christmas, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> cloves, mulled, yeah. Um, so you can, you can do experiments in which you just give people those smells, and co what comes back are often very old memories, very powerful memories uh, for the person. You can do it even with words. Just give the word cloves or mulled wine, 
and people are pretty good at thinking about memories. Actually, when you give them the words, the memories aren't so strong. There are more of them, but they're not so strong. And what these uh, people um, did in the university in Sweden is they uh, pitted these against each other, got those, replicated those results, but then they had a condition in which you both gave somebody the experience, but with the label. You know, so it's mulled wine, smell, and then the label, mulled wine. What they found was that the language, the label, trumped the smell in the sense that the memories that then came up with the real smell but the label were much more like just labeling it. In other words, the memories were not so intense when it was activated by words compared with the actual experience of smelling. It had taken some of the pleasantness out of it, the intensity out of it. You might say taken some of the sting out of it. The word, the concept, the idea of something <clears throat> is a useful thing that we humans have, but it removes some of the pain of it. So what can happen is that many people that have a lot of painful experiences actually move up into a sort of world in which they end up thinking about the pain as an alternative to re-experiencing it. And that can be really helpful for people from time to time, but it tends, again, if it becomes a habit, to backfire because it becomes a sort of preoccupation, a brooding, a, a what we call rumination, and that can make things worse. One of the distinctive things, however, is that rumination is going on in the head. And therefore, it suggests that there might be something we could do about it of enabling people to stay with what's going on but actually work through it through the body. And that's what mindfulness attempts to do. So I just want to pause for a moment, and we'll do another meditation in a moment, but I just want to summarise where we've got to. We're looking at the problem of recurrence in depression, we're um, seeing whether mindfulness has a role to play. And particularly, we're looking at the fact that when difficult things happen, sad moods can activate a whole complex of memories. And that the mind has different ways of responding to those memories and those experiences, one of which is suppression, which doesn't work very well. But the other is to use sort of overthinking or conceptual structures, which appears at first sight to lessen the blow of the actual experiences, because you're now thinking about it rather than re-experiencing it. But this brooding and rumination often just spreads into other associations. So what I want to do now is to do another meditation in which I just want you to notice the patterns of your own mind. So we really want mind wandering to happen here. So if you think meditation is about clearing the mind, then no. I want you just to, we'll give you an anchor, say on the breath, but just for two or three minutes, just notice when the mind goes off, where does it go? What associations does it have? <coughs> and now probably, having invited your mind to wander, guess what? Maybe your mind won't wander at all. <coughs> Maybe this is the treatment we've all been looking for. Tell your mind to wander. Okay, so once again, your feet flat on the floor if you'd like to do this, so you can really notice the children in the schools call this fofbok, feet on floor, bum on chair. <laughs> As christened by school children. So... So let's letting your gaze be lowered or eyes closed, if that feels comfortable to you, but it's okay if not. And notice the head and neck balanced on the shoulders, and the shoulders can be dropped, the spine long, and feeling the feet on the floor and the pressure of the chair on the thighs and buttocks. And then gathering your attention to the breath. Just notice the sensations of breathing. Now, you may notice the breath in the nose, in the nostrils, the cold air coming in, the warm air going out. So that's one place where you may follow the breath. Or you may feel the breath in the back of the throat, or the chest, or you may feel it, feel it right down in the abdomen. It doesn't really matter where you feel it most vividly, but, but maybe just staying with one place where you feel the breath, just choosing one of those places and staying with it there for a few moments. So... 
noticing the raw physical sensations of breathing. Once again, not trying to control the breath in any way or trying to achieve anything, simply allowing the breath to breathe itself. And very often when we do this work, the mind begins to wander. So if you notice that the mind's gone off somewhere, just notice where it went, perhaps the chain of associations that it began to generate. Just notice them, and then, when you're ready, escorting the attention back to the breath and starting again, and seeing if it happens again. goes off and we gently escort it back without giving yourself a hard time. If you have a mind it will wander. Noticing where it went, bring it back. So in the last few moments of this meditation, just coming back to the breath. And then beginning to move fingers and toes and letting the eyes open if they've been closed and taking the room again. Maybe now just for two, three minutes, just turn to your neighbour in twos and threes or turn around, whatever, introduce yourself if you don't know, and just <coughs> say, say as much or as little about your experience of your mind wandering and coming back and mind wandering and coming back, um, of what you noticed about that short meditation. So just um, now for two or three minutes, um, find somebody you don't know, perhaps you do, <laughs> and move up close. If you're not sitting next to somebody, just close up. to shout out anything that you found particularly noteworthy, just shout it out and I'll repeat it for the purposes of the video. Anybody want to share their experience with the whole group? I was 
I was running errands in Leeds, thinking of what I could do for um, working towards the dissertation, so collecting books in the library and, and making sure I've got everything. So running errands in Leeds, yeah. going to the library, everything you need for your dissertation. Then I started work, thinking about all the articles that got printed out at home, they've got loads of highlights and what I need to work <laughs> Okay, so then it went to the articles at home, to with all the highlighting. Absolutely. So this is a really good example. Thanks so much. So it started, first of all, with the breath, yeah? Well, maybe for a fraction of a second of the breath. And then uh, leads to different places. So your mind did a mental time travel. Yeah, kind of because I'm thinking, how much parking have we got? So what can I do in that parking time? How much parking? OK. So we had the parking issue as well. This is a very entertaining life. Absolutely. So, and you're going to do it tomorrow, so, but already your mind was doing planning, okay, remembering things that you had to do. This is a really important feature of the mind, you know, that the mind has this <coughs> sense of uh, the unfinished business. Um, after all, we need that because this is, this is what I'm saying about um, it's not the mind's mistake that it runs off. It's actually what we need it to be doing, working the background reminders of things. Of course, when it's finished with what you're doing tomorrow and all this dissertation stuff, if it actually settled that, there'd be stuff perhaps from last year or the year before or something like that, or that novel you meant to write by the time you were 30 or 40 or whatever. Absolutely. So it can do all sorts of reminding. Thank you. Yeah. Any other sort of a little cascade of associations? Maybe one more. The breathing felt heavy, yeah? Um, and then that made me start to think that I need to lose weight and therefore I need to go get my shopping list so that I can decide what to have for dinner. Okay. <laughs> so, like, it's uh, breathing felt heavy, I need to lose weight, get the shopping list, prepare dinner. Uh, yeah. And that, did it stop there or did you, did you come back to the breath or did and you go I further? I was actually thinking about tomorrow's night dinner and then I was thinking, but I don't know what I'm going to have tonight instead. So, tomorrow's night's dinner you were thinking of. <laughs> so, then tonight. Then tonight. Okay. Then, uh, Okay, so what else to get to the supermarket? Okay, so messaging. Did you did you find your hand almost going to your phone to message your boyfriend? No, I had to write down what I needed to ask him if he wanted before I forgot it. Okay, so okay, so if, for those who didn't hear it, so there's a, a little sort of um, scenario playing out here, which is, starts with a sort of heavy uh, breathing, feeling heavy, sense of needing to lose weight, sense of actually what am I going to buy, sense of needing to check with boyfriend what he wants, sense of actually, oh, it's tomorrow night or is it tonight? And then the sense of I'm going to write down what, it's a lot of stuff. And at what point did you sort of catch yourself saying, oh, this isn't where I intended my mind to be? When I needed to write down what I needed to ask him. Right, when you but needed to write down when you're going to ask him. Wake up and do that and then I can start again. Okay, so I'd better get that done and then I'll start the meditation again. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's a very common thing that we think, oh, our mind's gone so far, we've, we've lost it now, so we'll just do that, then start again. And so one of the discoveries is that actually one can just let that sort of, it becomes so compelling to do something about it that it gives you a really good opportunity to notice what compulsion feels like. Um, so you could write it down, um, but actually... Um, it also provides an opportunity for you just to sit there and go, oh, let's just have a look at this. Let's have a look at this, because actually learning about these patterns whereby we get driven by the habits of mind um, often means that we don't notice that we might have choices there, that actually writing a message to a boyfriend or planning the meal or whatever might be just one of the number of possible things that you might need to do, but we often don't think about the possibility we just do one of them because that seems the most important thing to do. So what mindfulness does isn't mean that you have to just sit there solemnly, you know, for hours and hours and end whatever's happening. And that's a nice song. Um, <laughs> that, that, that you don't... It actually gives you choice. If it comes, turns out to be really important to remember it, of course you can sort of write it down. But also you might say, right, the, the feeling I must get this, otherwise I'm going to forget it, is something I might recognise as a habit that affects my life in other situations too. So let's let that feeling be there in my laboratory of my mindfulness practice so I can just notice where, how my body's involved in that, how my arm's beginning to move, how my mind beginning to say, I can't rest until I've done this. Because although that might be a small example, the spirit and the theory of this is that those small habits that show up in our mindfulness practice are often examples of what happens in the outside world as well. And that's especially true, so thank you very much indeed. 
that's especially true of people who've been through depression many times, that the habits that show up in a mindfulness practice, like I'm no good at this, this is stupid, this is not really for me, um, that this is stupid, this is not really for me, is not just about the practice. That might have been when they were at their first disco at university, or that might have been when they walked into the room in their first year lecture theatre, or it might be halfway through the course, or whatever. Very powerful feeling, which doesn't feel it has the choice there. It feels that I, you, know, you feel completely helpless and abandoned. So having examined these little, little habits of mind, you get more prepared to deal with the big ones when they come. So thank you, thank you for those examples of the associations. <clears throat> what we saw in both examples there is one elegant feature of the mind, um, which philosophers call counterfactual reasoning. Um, and that is where the mind fills up with things that haven't happened yet, or that have happened, but it could have gone otherwise. Um, I was in Schiphol Airport a few years ago, and Schiphol Airport has its railway track underneath the airport concourse, so it's very easy to access the airport in Amsterdam. Um, and so they, it, it isn't very far down, so they don't have escalators, they have moving walkways. You know these walkways that you stride along feeling like you're making great progress? Um, with that voice at the end saying, step off now. Um, well, in Amsterdam, they, they just bend down to the, uh, to the, to the railway, uh, which is great, except if, as somebody standing in front of me had, was two large suitcases with a wheel at four corners. And with a large suitcase with a wheel at four corners, they're really sort of easy to use when it's flat, but difficult to use when it's slopey. And indeed, the bigger of these two cases set off without its owner, <laughs> down, hurtling towards the, uh, the platform. And I said, I'll hold this one, you go after it. So he went after it, and uh, Nasa, uh, he disappeared. Well, the case gathered pace faster than he did. <laughs> so the case disappeared round the corner, and I was thinking, oh my god, what's going to happen there? Because a big, big case, these things, you know? Um, and very heavy. Uh, when, by the time I got there, he, Luckily, the platform was deserted. He was standing on the edge of the platform, looking down on his case, which had scooted right across, was now falling on, which was now lying on the railway track. So we looked around for a sort of a, a somebody with a peaked hat, and uh, um, and there was nobody, no official around at all. And we thought, well, if a train comes in, well, it's going to be a problem. So we stood looking at each other, looking at the case, <laughs> looking to see if we could spot an electric line. Um, Though, what did we know? <laughs> I haven't got a clue. But anyway, we eventually, in our wisdom, diagnosed la no electric line. Um, and then <laughs> I said, you know, I think you're going to have to go down and fetch it. I'll hold your bag. <laughs> in a moment of great bravery. And so he let down, picked it up, put it back, let back up, and we were back to normal. And th it was then he realised he was actually on the wrong uh, platform. <laughs> and he trundled off to find the right platform. And what I know, because it happened to me all that day and several, several months afterwards, is the what if. Like, it had all happened really happily. But you can be plagued by what if there'd been people there? What if that, you know, had knocked? What if there'd been train coming in? What if this? What if that? Counterfactual reasoning is the what ifs. And so a lot of our thinking is what if, like, oh, what if I went today rather than tomorrow? What if I did tomorrow's menu rather than today's? What if I did this? What would this? And, and it's a beautiful, elegant aspect of the mind. But it also has another variant, which is if only, especially with the past. If only I hadn't done that. If only they hadn't done that. And the what ifs, if, if, if only, can create such a, um, a sort of a complex of imaginative stories in our mind. I mean, we all know it, the what ifs, I suppose, the middle of the night thinking is what we mostly recognize. Even if we've never been depressed or never had any sort of big sort of clinical problem in our lives, we know what it's like to be awake in the middle of the night, not being able to get to sleep, when ideas are churning round and round and round. And very often it's a planning, it's a what if, or if only, or, or um, uh, it's a, it can be very damaging. And yet, the mind is doing the best it can. It's trying to problem solve. It's trying to think of all the other scenarios that might be. And in its problem solving attempts, it can create more mayhem than you had at the start. 
So we know that people that have trauma, for example, end up with a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. For example, after a road traffic accident or after an assault. Um, very often, not only have flashbacks to cope with of the actual event itself, which is bad enough, but there's often a whole array of what-ifs or if-onlys. If only I hadn't walked down that street. If only I hadn't driven that route. If only, or what if, or sometimes even things that didn't happen, like what if I'd been killed? What would happen to my children? And they, you can be just as tortured by the if onlys and what ifs, by the counterfactuals, as by the event that happened itself, as if that wasn't bad enough. And the, 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 um, the ways in which different sort of therapeutic modes tackle this, they tackle it in different ways. And mindfulness is not just a panacea which is going to work for everything and elbows out everything else that's ever been tried, because clearly there are many different ways of dealing with this. But what mindfulness does is invite you, first of all, to notice those associations when they're not so strong. Even this in a two-minute meditation, you begin to notice those associations and begin to see those as, as mental events, as actually things that are going on in your head, in your mind, as it were, it's, 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 your experience is real, but it's not necessarily the truth of things. And this business about inventing a, 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 an imagined scenario and then feeling all the grief of that scenario to add to the grief of what already has happened to us is something that mindfulness addresses. Counterfactual reasoning, this rumination and preoccupation can be all pervasive. And what psychologists now tell us is actually our preoccupations, it's, they are, they're with us all the time. I mean, it's not just a question of big trauma or events at Schiphol Airport. We actually go around in our, living in our heads quite a lot of the time. You know, if, we're, if we want a cup of tea and we notice, oh, there's no, there's no clean cup, so we clean the cups to wash the to wash the dishes to get a clean cup for our cup of tea before we go out shopping and, <laughs> and getting the stuff in for tomorrow or going to the library or... Well, you know, cleaning the cup is irrelevant because it's the cup of tea we're looking for. So we're focused on the cup of tea we're going to have rather than the cleaning the cups. So we miss the cleaning of the cups, we miss the water, we miss the, the, the feel of the water on our hands. You know, from the age of three, probably, when we messed about and our t parents told us not to, we probably haven't felt the water on our hands very because we're focused on the tea, but where is your mind when you're having that cup of tea? That's the question. You've planned the tea when you're doing the... You've missed the washing. This is Thich Nhat Hanh's example, the Vietnamese monk. Probably when you're drinking the tea, your mind is on your shopping. And so you end up with, like, an empty cup, thinking, oh, oh, did I just drink that, or did somebody else drink it? I don't remember drinking that tea. Um, and so you've got an empty cup. So you've just missed the dishes, and you've just missed the cup, of tea, and then you drive to the or walk to the supermarket or whatever, and you miss the walk because you're thinking about what you're going to buy. So you don't you don't see things around you. And then when you're going around the supermarket, you're thinking how long the queues will be, or whether to use those annoying automotive voices that always get it wrong. Put the bag back. Or <laughs> I don't have a bag. I don't have a bag. No, put the bag back. No, honestly, I don't have a bag. Where's the button saying call attendant? Um, oh, there's no button. Oh, there, here comes an attendant. No, it's not an attendant. Um, you know, the, all that, you're worried about that. Or if you're standing in a queue, you're thinking, I should have been in that queue. <laughs> so you spend the whole time thinking, if I made a dash to that queue, would I make it in time? Or would, oh, no, somebody's coming. And so you better stay here. And then the person in front of you, they can't get the price of the loaf of bread. So somebody has to go and find the price of the loaf of bread. And so, that, so then when you're, you're thinking about driving home and then you're thinking about cooking, you're living your whole life actually leaning into the next moment. You know, w walking at that sort of angle, like a Lowry painting, walking, walking at that angle, leaning to the next moment rather than actually no even noticing that you're in this one. And the pity of it is that we could wake up in the end of our lives with six months or six weeks to live and look back on our life and say, was that the empty cup? Was that the life? That was it. And I may not get another one. You know, that was it. I've just lived it. Moment by moment by moment, I've sort of willfully sort of squandered my life because I didn't actually notice I was alive. <coughs> Joseph, a um, guy who worked on myth for many years and died in the 1980s, 
uh, has a wonderful quote about, um, in this interaction, somebody said to him, was myths which stand at the beginning of all cultures, you know, they're very common myths, even though people have been um, living thousands of miles apart, you go back into their myths and they're often very, very similar. And Joseph Campbell had this quote which said that myths are not about finding the meaning of the life. So his question said, well, are, are they helping us get the meaning of life? And he said, people say they're looking for the meaning of life, but I don't think that's what they're looking for. I think what they're looking for is the experience of being alive. And that's a very different, subtly different, but really important thing. <coughs> it's not about a conceptual thing of understanding life, though wouldn't it be wonderful if we did? It's, and we, but we get so caught up in our preoccupations of trying to understand that we actually miss our life. Now, when you put all the mindfulness practices together into an eight-week program, as we did in something called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, offered it to people who had been depressed um, three or more times, and in our most recent research, find that it cuts the relapse rates over that critical next 12-month period uh, by about half. But it doesn't... Um, some people still relapse. So one of the questions is, who does it work best for? Who get the most benefit? And it turns out that the people who get most benefit are people who have had most trauma in childhood and adolescence. They get the most benefit. Um, but it also turns out that anybody who goes through a mindfulness course has to practice the meditations every day. We looked at how much people practiced, and we found that actually people that practiced more got bigger benefit did those formal practices day by day. And that was independent of how enthusiastic they were for mindfulness. So some people were really enthusiastic about mindfulness but didn't practice, didn't get much benefit. Some people were a bit grumpy about mindfulness, didn't really want to be there, but they did the practice and they got the benefit. So it sort of reinforces the idea of just actually doing it and experiencing it rather than just thinking about it or planning one day I will do this. <clears throat> and we've also done research to say, well, if people come to classes to do a mindfulness class, is it really the mindfulness which helps them, or is it just coming to class? Well, we had a control group where people just came to class, talking about depression, sharing their experience of depression, but not learning to meditate. And the evidence was it got people about halfway in terms of the relapse rates of over the next uh, 12 months. <coughs> but if, they, if you wanted to take people, to give them the full benefit, people actually had to uh, learn to, to do the meditations and, and then to carry them out. So the research is still investigating what are the mechanisms. It turns out that, just like Eleanor said, what people learn is to be compassionate about their own experience. That as people learn to do the sort of work we've been just sampling today, people actually find a compassion for their own experience growing, a sort of sometimes a sense of humor about where the mind goes, a sense of being able to stand back from the mind to see the thoughts and feelings that come like clouds in the sky, sometimes very black clouds, but something you can see coming and going, and you don't have to take it all personally, as if they're telling the truth about you. You can learn from the themes, as we've been hearing, but not actually think, so, it must be true that I'm a bad person. It, 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 it's about approaching the, the, your own mind and body uh, with compassion. And I want to finish with a sh short meditation, but... Other one or two questions before we get into the, the last meditation and then go off for a break. Any one or two buzz questions? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, um, looking at um, the way we do drift from one point to another point, as early one meditating. I felt um, we can actually link it to dementia as well. Uh, I, um, s there was a time someone was saying um, everybody got the element of dementia and are actually responsible for forgetfulness and um, sometimes um, anybody can forget in the midst of many things at the same time. Yeah. So, is it true that um, when, we, when we forget, it's part of dementia? Okay. So, the, um, well, I mean, there's a whole spectrum of forgetfulness. And dementia is when there seems to be a biological process going on that actually means that, it, that 
we cannot retrieve whole episodes of our life, usually starting from <coughs> fairly recent life, short-term memory goes, and then further back and further back. And although some of those memories can be recovered with some procedures that have now been used in which you take sort of lots of photographs of what people are doing each day from their own perspective and show them, and sometimes you can quite remarkably find that the memory, a little memory comes back, it's actually the memories seem to become really inaccessible. And that seems to be more than just ordinary forgetfulness, though there is a spectrum of forgetfulness. However, there's one thing I think for, people, for early dementia sufferers, and that is that sometimes the anxiety and the worry and the sadness as people um, are aware or more and more aware of their problem and then get a diagnosis, that we know that anxiety and depression can itself affect memory. Um, with some studies that I did a long time ago with a, with a colleague who was interested in brain damage, young people come off their motorbikes and end up with head injuries and can't remember, often can't remember the episode, but also have memory problems caused by the brain damage. We estimated that about half of their memory problems were due to the brain damage and half was due to their worrying and rumination and, and their preoccupation. Sometimes preoccupation with not being able to remember the accident itself. So there is scope, I think, for looking at the forgetfulness that actually we can do something about that's born of the anxiety and depression. Um, but without um, uh, um, somehow demeaning the memory problems that people can't very easily do anything about because of the organic process that's going on in dementia. So thank you. Let's finish then with uh, a short sort of two-minute meditation. Um, we'll do a sort of two-minute breathing space. So once again, well, you know what to do now. Feet on the floor. And stepping, this idea of changing the posture to represent a, a stepping out of autopilot. So just noticing, noticing what's happening in mind and body right now. And that's the first step of this breathing space, is to notice what's going on. Noticing what's going on in your mind in terms of thoughts or feelings. Any sensations in the body? Acknowledging what's going on without trying to change it. And then coming to the breath. So the second step is to gather in the attention and place it one place where you feel the breath moving. And if the mind wanders, simply bringing it back. with great tenderness and compassion for the mind. And then the third step, expanding the attention to the body as a whole, sitting here, aware of the whole body. All the sensations from there top of the head to the bottom of the feet and right out to the surface of the skin. As if the whole body was breathing now. And allowing the body to be just as you find it. Just as it is. Accepting it as it is. A sense of coming home to this body. sense of openness and spaciousness. And as best we can, bringing this sense of openness to the next few moments of our day. As we begin to move fingers and toes, allow our eyes to open, taking the room again. Thank you very much indeed for your warm and kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Thank you. We're going to take a short break now. We've got half an hour. Um, uh, there are refreshments and the uh, exhibitors just, just literally down the hall for those that are in this building here. For those of you listening in at the Rose Bowl, uh, you're welcome to join us. You've got plenty of time to get across to, to, to the Portland building and come up onto the first floor.
um, and uh, go to the Student Union area and we'll see you there. So we'll see you back here uh, on 3.30 if you can be prompt, that would be great. We'll finish off with, uh, with Oliver's final session. Thank you very much.